the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling us. Better than you. 
Good morning, church. My name is Tyler, one of the pastors here. Welcome to our announcements for Sunday, February the 21st. So glad to be able to gather with you this morning in our homes together as the church to worship. And uh, we'd love to be able to connect with you if you're uh, newer to Westview, if you've been watching with us for the last few weeks or months, uh, but we haven't had the chance to be able to get to know you uh, yet. We'd love to be able to do so. There's a few ways around here that you can connect with us. Uh, The first one on our homepage is a Discover More button. If you click that, uh, there's many ways in which you can follow that to connect with us as a pastoral team, or uh, just send us an email. It's connect at westviewbaptistchurch.ca. It's just on the screen below, uh, and we would love to be able to follow up with you if there's any needs we can meet, anything we can be praying for you about, we would love uh, to be able to do that. So welcome to Westview this morning. Let me share with you a few announcements that we have. Uh, First one is this. Cadre, as we've been mentioning for the last few weeks, uh, is beginning in early March. It is our adult discipleship experience. Uh, We have three classes that we will be launching in just a few weeks. And so I'd encourage you, go to our website, to westviewbaptistchurch.ca. Click on our ministries tab, and then you'll scroll down to find Cadre. Uh, All the information is there. Registration is live. It is open. We'd love to have you come uh, and be a part of our discipleship experience this year. So click on that. If you have any questions, let me know. I'd love to be able to share with you more about Cadre. The next thing, church, is this past week we launched uh, our partnership with the Calgary Food Bank. Uh, We are the only satellite distribution center in the northwest quadrant of the city. Uh, It was an incredible day. We are so thankful for this opportunity uh, to provide food security for the people of Northwest Calgary. If you'd like to serve uh, on this ministry, be a part of what's going on here with that, uh, connect with Reese. Uh, his email is below, and he'd love to be able to share more about this with you. Uh, church, the important announcement that I want to share is tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is our AGM. It happens at 7 p.m. It is on Zoom. Uh, all the information is on our website. You go to our events tab, and you click on the AGM information. Uh, There is uh, our AGM report. Uh, There is information on how to log in and how to vote, how to be a part of our AGM meeting. If there's any questions that you have, uh, please connect with the church office tomorrow morning, uh, and we'd love to be able to share that with you. But we are excited to be able to gather. Uh, There's a lot of important things that will be happening at that meeting, so please head to our website, have a look at that information. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out and connect with us. Church, that's it for this morning. Let me pray for us now as we head into this time of giving. Uh, As always, information is on your screen on how to give, uh, as well on the top right-hand corner of our website. There is a giving button. If you click that, uh, all the information is there. So church, let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this chance that we can uh, be your church, that we can worship you. And so I pray that you will continue to work in and through our lives as we give to you now, Lord. Thank you uh, for what you have done for us, Lord. You've given us your son. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We're in John chapter 6 this morning as we continue in our series on John and We'll get there in a second, but just as introduction to it, I I wonder if you've ever seen those checklists, perhaps on the internet, perhaps somewhere else, 
a checklist for how to be a good wife, husband, neighbor, dog owner, cat owner, you name it, it's there. So say you see one and it's for uh, how to be a good husband. And you scan down the list, and there's 75 things on that checklist, and you're able to check off at least six of them. And you realize that ah, that's maybe not the best, and so you make a few mid-year resolutions that probably won't last. And you begin to feel guilty, and you begin to feel inadequate, and you begin to wonder just who bookmarked that for me anyway. And in this chapter, that is sort of what is happening. The heart of the chapter is a question that's asked of Jesus. And he's really asked the question, what do I need to do to please God? And as we look at that, I kind of put in the email on Wednesday, you know, that comes out in the afternoon that has the teaser on it for, for the sermon. I put in there that the answer to that question is a one-word answer in a 71-verse chapter explained by a three-point sermon, illustrated by two miracles that all reveal the secret of how to experience life not as a checklist, but as a banquet. And since our chapter does have 71 verses this morning, we're not going to read it all. In fact, we're going to spend most of our time in the second half, which is the part that we're the least familiar with. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water is in all four Gospels. Uh, but the last part of John is only in John. And it's the part that tends to get left out. So we're going to look at that. And on the, ser on the web, there is sermon notes that are there. I, I put these out so that you can follow along. You can make notes in there. Uh, it has the scripture reading and... You're welcome to just click on that and download it or print it or whatever you like. But it's a way of keeping track of where we're going in the sermon. We're going to look at the last half. We're going to look at the answer to that question that Jesus gives, how do we please God? But we need two things for context. First of all, we do need to understand how the chapter starts because we're cutting in in the middle. And it starts with two things. It starts, first of all, by Jesus feeding 5,000 people. And Jesus feeds these people in a miraculous way that all four Gospels actually write up. And I assume because of that and because of how popular that story is, you probably know something about it, so I'll leave you either to read it or just to remember things that you've been taught about it. But the second part of it comes when, at the end of that feeding, Jesus wants to go pray, and he wants to be alone, so he sends the people back home to their villages. He tells the disciples they can head back to Capernaum across the lake in the boat. He'll just grab an Uber later, and he will go up and pray for a while. So he goes up and prays. The disciples head across the lake, and in the night, a storm comes up, and they get stuck in the middle of the lake. And Jesus comes walking across the lake to them, calms the storm, gets in their boat. And in the Gospel of Matthew, you remember that story is also added, perhaps, that Matthew gets out of the, or uh, Peter gets out of the boat and tries to walk with Jesus. But after the great miracle, well, I'm guessing you've probably heard sermons on that one before, too. So we're going to leave that one alone. That's kind of the summary of it. You want to read it. It's uh, there in John. But that gets us to where we start in this chapter. But there's just one other thing for background, and that is about the Passover. John says in chapter 6, verse 4, it was Passover. And one of the things about John is he doesn't give detail. And when he does, it's there for a reason. It's not just color. It's not just throwaway. There's something about Passover that's important. In fact, from John 5 to chapter 10, which is sort of the end of the story of Jesus' public ministry, then he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, then he's going to spend some time in the upper room with his disciples, and then he's going to be killed. So this whole time of John's record of Jesus being in public, it's wrapped around different feasts and different special days. 
We looked last week at Sabbath, this week at Passover, next week it's the Feast of Tabernacles or booths where the people lived in in, uh, tents, basically. And then the next week is dedication, which we know as Hanukkah. And then the next week is back to Passover again. But Passover is important because the whole chapter is anchored in the images of Passover. So just to remind you quickly, um, when Israel were slaves in Egypt back in the day, Moses, God calls Moses. Moses is going to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. He's going to take them away from Pharaoh. The Egyptians refuse, so God sends these plagues. And the last plague, the tenth plague, is the killing of the firstborn son. And it's that plague because God sees Israel as his firstborn that Egypt has been killing. And so now it's payback time on the Egyptians. And God says to the Israelites, now you are in danger of your firstborn son being killed as well unless you take a lamb and you kill it at a certain time on this certain day and you take some of the blood and put it on your doorposts and you have this special meal made with unleavened bread. And if you do that, then... I will pass over your house, and death will not come there. And then God gives them detailed instructions on how to celebrate that every year as a reminder that this is where they came from. So Moses leads the people of Israel out of Egypt, and as you remember that story, perhaps they come to the Red Sea, and they're trapped between the sea and the Egyptian army that's chasing them, And God miraculously parts the sea, and the people pass over the sea to freedom. And then they get to the desert. And as soon as they get in the desert, you think, well, all their problems are over now. They've escaped from Egypt. But now they're in a desert, and they're complaining about food. They're grumbling away. And God gives them manna, which is sort of like dew, which is like a dough that you can either eat raw or you can cook, or you can bake it, you can boil it, you can make bagels out of it, I don't know. But they get this manna, the special bread. And God makes all of this into a yearly feast that the Jews celebrate. And all of this is remembered. And Passover is technically just the one day, but then there's seven more days called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the entire feast of of Passover put together. And people were, men in Israel were to go down to Jerusalem as often as possible to celebrate that there. So, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's against this background that John tells this story. John tells the story of the miraculous feeding of a large group of people. He tells the story of Jesus miraculously crossing over the Sea of Galilee, passing over, if you want. And all of that leads to the passages that we often overlook at the back because it's the explanation, or some would say the sermon, that Jesus gives where he explains all this. And it all comes when the people of Capernaum confront him and they ask this question, how do we please God? And they don't like his answer. So, now we're ready to start. And, uh, you know, sometimes in life there's a step before the first step. Those were the two steps before the first step. But now we're back to Capernaum. Now we're back to where the story starts. And we pick up the story. It's the day after the feeding, the day after the walking on water. The crowd finds Jesus, and they're intrigued to try and figure out how he got there. That seems to be the biggest uh, question they have on their minds. Uh, Tabloid news, you know, like, how did you get here? Uh, They don't care about the feeding. They don't care about anything. All they want to know is, how did you get here? And then it says in verse 26, Jesus answered, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And so Jesus meets these people. All they want to know is how he got back. And Jesus just brushes that off. And he accuses them of just having any interest in him at all because he's like a free uh, vending machine for food. 
you know, they can go out into the thing, they can sit there and listen to him for a while, and then all this great food comes rolling out. And he tells them that, you know, important as uh, physical food is, that's not the most important thing. And he says to them, don't work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life. And what we're going to find in this passage is that their questions drive Jesus' entire agenda. Uh, we'll figure out how that works in a second, but, but they pick up on these words about not working for things that pass, but for working for things that endure to eternal life. And they say to him, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What kind of work are you talking about? And I just wonder if that isn't sort of the number one question that most people don't have when they're coming to God, or even many of us that have come to God and, and hopefully have a relationship with him. We keep asking the question, what is it that we should do that would please God? What is the checklist of things that please God? How do we earn God's favor and God's blessing? And Jesus gives us a great and freeing answer in verse 29. He says, this is the work of God that you believe in him who's sent. And Jesus cuts through all that and he just says, you know, it's not about work, it's just simply about believing. This is the work of God that you believe. It's putting your trust in someone that has already done everything that needs to be done. But the people don't just take that at face value. They want to know, well, okay, but why should I believe in you? Why should I not trust in God in some way? Why should I not wait for the Messiah to come? Why should I trust in you? And so the people said to him in verse 30, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Now our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So, Feast of Unleavened Bread, looking back at Passover on this story, first thing that comes into their head, obviously, because Jesus has done this miracle to kind of incite this, is that they say, well, you know, Moses gave people manna from heaven. And the people are pushing back. They're kind of saying, well, show us a miracle if you want us to believe in you. And they're saying to Jesus, now Moses gave us bread from heaven, and it was special stuff. You gave us like barley loaves, and you got them from this little kid who gave you the kind of the makings, if you want, and you just expanded them. And uh, now we're going to launch into this. And we're trying to figure out exactly where we are. I mean, we know we're in Capernaum, because that's given. At verse 59, which is at the end of all this, it says they're in the synagogue at Capernaum. So when they find him, my understanding is that they're in the synagogue and Jesus becomes the preacher of the day. And if all of this is said in the synagogue, it begins to make sense because of how they preached in those days. So synagogue sermons back in Jesus' day had a flow to them. You were given a text you know, out of the Bible. You were allowed to restate the text, and then you kind of took it point by point by point, and you explained that, and then you were allowed to restate it all in summary fashion, and that's how it worked. But in the meantime, the people are talking with each other, and they're discussing and arguing and agreeing with you, and uh, as point by point you go through this, they're kind of agreeing or disagreeing point by point. And that's what we're going to see in this passage. It's probably exactly what you're doing online. You know, you don't have to be in church or whatever, so you're free to disagree with me, you're free to point out whatever. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. It's great. That's what they actually did in the synagogue. And uh, must have been an interesting kind of place to, pr to preach. But... In some sense, the people gave Jesus the text for the day. Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus restates that. He says, well, actually, if you want to be precise, it wasn't Moses. It was God. 
Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the bread, true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so the people pick up on that, and it becomes Jesus' first point. They said to him, give us this bread always. And Jesus uh, is used to being misunderstood for being speaking figuratively and being taken literally. And they said, well, give us this bread. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And the people say, you know, if you would just give us bread like Moses gave the people that manna, we would believe in you. And Jesus says, no, I don't have bread to give. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of heaven. And the I am is emphatic. Jesus will use it throughout the gospel. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. And the I am reminds the people of Moses when he's first confronted by God at the burning bush. He says to God, what's your name? What do I call you? And God says, I am who I am. And when Jesus uses that I am, the people get steamed up enough that you know that they have recognized that illusion that I am signifies God somehow. So that's the first point. Give us this bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread. I've come and I'm giving myself to you. I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. And that becomes the second point. The, the Jews grumbled about this because he said, I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? And how does he now say, I've come down from heaven? And so the Jews have caught on at the end of the first point that he's calling himself the bread. But not just bread, the bread out of heaven. In other words, that he is God that he has come down from heaven, and how can that be when they know his entire family? And some of them knew him growing up. And just parenthetically, we, we, we read a word here that just tells us that we're on the right track with understanding this in the context of that story from Exodus. Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. One of the passages that was read during this Feast of Unleavened Bread this week of Passover was a passage from Exodus 16 where the people were given this bread, this manna. And here's what it says. See if you can figure out a theme. The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we have died at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. Which they didn't, but anyway. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. And it's this playing on this word grumbling that kind of gives us a clue that we're in the right area when we're trying to understand this against that story of Passover. Jesus answered a little bit later, do not grumble among yourselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And Jesus says, no, no, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And then that last sentence catches the people and leads into the third point. Because Jesus has dealt with being bread. He's dealt with being bread from heaven. But he ends with this sort of questionable statement that they need to eat his flesh. And this is where it gets a little confusing for some of us as well, I'm sure. Because that's his, actually his third point, is that you need to eat my flesh. 
And the Jews, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So the sermon is going on. He's got point one in. They've had a discussion about that. They've asked a question. That's led to point two. They've had a discussion about that. It leads to point three. And they've asked this question that's leading to this. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus, instead of making that simpler, seems to complicate it. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me will also live because of me. Now, Jesus just doesn't make it any easier. You think you would say, Jesus, they're not getting it. You need to simplify this a little bit. But he doesn't. He talks about eating his body and drinking his blood, both of which are offensive to us, say nothing of the Jews. And the Jews in Jesus' day and the Jews today, uh, one of the things that they can't do is they can't eat meat that has blood in it. So not only can't you drink blood, you can't even eat meat that has blood in it. So it's just offensive. And Jesus has kind of got their attention in a very serious way. And you kind of wonder, well, why? Well, let me just qualify a little bit, and then let me answer it. So the qualifying, I think what's interesting is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at the end of Jesus' life, they meet in the upper room just before Good Friday on the Monday, Thursday, on the Thursday before Good Friday, and Jesus takes Passover and makes it into communion that we celebrate every month. John doesn't do that. If you notice uh, John at the upper room, he does not have a communion there. This is his communion. It's way back here. And I think he does that because John writes his gospel last. He writes it 20 or 30 years after everybody else, and he writes it 50 or 60 years after the events that happened. And he writes it in Ephesus, most likely, to the church that's there. And the church that's there has been celebrating communion the way we would celebrate communion for the last 50 or 60 years. And so they understand what he's alluding to when he talks about, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood shed for you. They understand that the way we would. So when... Jesus said this, one of the things we have to realize is we just have a synopsis, we just have a summary of the sermon. I'm sure the sermon was much longer. I'm sure Jesus preached longer than I do. And John has just summarized the high points. And he summarized it in a way that his readers, who are his own church in Ephesus in 90 AD, say, will understand. And what he's left out, perhaps, is just some of the explanation that Jesus did give. Now, he didn't give a lot, because they were still confused. But, you know, like sometimes at our church uh, board meetings, we'll sometimes ramble a field for a while. And, you know, for 20 minutes, we'll be talking about six different things, and, and it's a wonderful conversation. And the minutes will come out, and they'll say, uh, what do they say? A wide-ranging discussion ensued. Well, that's a little bit, I think, about what John's done. He's summarized here. There was probably a bit more explanation for the people of his day, but, or the people of Jesus' day, but it's still pretty cryptic because the people in Jesus' day didn't understand him. It wasn't as cryptic as it might have been, but it wasn't that easy to understand either. And John says a lot of people quit following Jesus at this point. But what's interesting is the disciples don't. The disciples keep following him even though they did not understand it at that point either. And I just think there's a really important principle in that. And that is this, that understanding God is impossible because God is so much bigger than we are. And there's going to be questions that we have. You know, I always say when I get to heaven, I want to know about why is there suffering. I want to know a couple of other things as well. And I don't have the answers to those. 
But I believe God and I trust God and I've experienced God in such a way that I'm willing to live with the ambiguity. I am not waiting to have all my questions answered before I have faith and believe in God. And I think that's what God's calling us to. And just parenthetically in this, in this story, the disciples were willing to kind of keep thinking about this until it all clicked together. And I think maybe at the Last Supper or maybe after Jesus was gone back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came down, they began to understand it afresh and anew. Anyway, all of us have questions. The question is, are we willing to believe and trust in the God we know in spite of some of the questions that we still have to carry with us? But that's three points. That's all you're allowed in a sermon. So now Jesus just restates and closes up this sermon. And he restates his text one last time in verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. And whoever feeds on this bread will last forever. And Jesus sort of in that restates his three points. I am the bread. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And the bread that if you eat it, you will live forever. So Jesus is trying to answer that question that we asked at the beginning. What does it take to please God? And you might say, well, this sounds like a very confusing answer to that question. But we need to remember that all of this happened in the context for those people of Passover. It happened after a feeding of 5,000 people, miraculously. It happened after the crossing of the sea. It all came about at Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And many of the passages that were alluded to in this, they had been reading during that week of this Feast of the Passover. And I think God did all of that to show that what Passover was intended to be was not just a remembrance of what happened back in Egypt. It was a prediction that someone was going to come and fulfill all of this, that Passover would be fulfilled in Jesus, that all of this pointed to him and was fulfilled in him. And that one of the proofs that he was the Son of God was that he would fulfill Passover. In some ways, last week we saw he fulfilled Sabbath. Next week we'll see he fulfills the Feast of Tabernacles. But he is the fulfillment. All of this predicted him and starts to give us some assurance that he is the bread that came from heaven. So at the end of the day, what's the takeaway? What do we do with it? The people had asked, what work must we do to do, to have life? And Jesus said, believe. And the question comes, well, what does believe look like? Well, at one point he says, to believe is to abide, to eat my flesh and to drink my blood. Whoever does that abides in me. He says, if, if faith is like bread and wine, you got to eat it and drink it. You can't just put it in Tupperware and save it and say, oh, this is really nice stuff. You have to eat it and drink it, and that eating and drinking it is this abiding. It's this having a relationship with God. It's this deep relationship with God on a daily basis. Because for the Jewish person of Jesus' day, bread and wine was the staple of every dinner. And so far in the Gospel of John, what, what, what Jesus has done is he's made virtually unlimited bread for this crowd on the hill, and he's made virtually unlimited wine for this wedding at Cana. It's this idea that there is no end to God's supply, and we just need to come in and accept and receive. We just need to come into relationship. It's like a banquet. In fact, John will describe it that way at the end of his book of Revelation. 
Let us rejoice and exult, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the question we started with was simply this question, what does it take to please God? And we talked about, well, is it a checklist of all these things? Well, you know, we need to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And Jesus said, no, this is the work of God, to believe in the one whom he has sent. And the answer this this morning is very simply this. If you want to please God, you need to believe in him. And believing in him is is a deep believing. It's not just, well, yeah, I believe in that. Jesus said, it's like eating bread and drinking wine. It's like eating my body and drinking my blood. It's this deep entering into me, this deep abiding that he will talk about in a later chapter, about abiding like a vine, like a branch on a vine. And so... Jesus comes to us today and we ask him, what do we need to do to please you? And he says, believe. Not just believe, but believe. Believe with all your heart. Believe with all your soul. Believe with all your mind. Believe with all your strength. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. Enter into this. Make this your life. And when you do that... No longer is it about a checklist of, well, there's this and this and this and this and this. There's only one thing. It's this relationship with God through faith. Not rules or checklists of how to be a good Christian. Just this deep abiding, this deep living with God, this eating and drinking in a sense. And when we get that right, God's promise comes true to us. I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance and have it in fullness. How do we please God? Well, not by the little things we do, but by trusting in him, by eating his flesh, drinking his blood in that pictorial sense of just fully taking him into ourselves and putting ourselves fully into him, that we can have this relationship of abundance. And so, Father God, this morning, we thank you. We thank you for this passage, which is challenging and long and deep and difficult. But as we see it kind of broken down into these points where Jesus is the bread, the bread from heaven, the bread that if we eat and drink, we have life. And Father God, we pray that you would help us to move beyond this idea that we can please you by a checklist of little things, that we may believe in you in a deep way, believe in you in spite sometimes of some of the doubts and and uncertainties we have about some things, but believe in you because you are the bread that came from heaven. You are what satisfies You are what gives life. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.